Good morning. Uh, thanks uh, very much for that intro, which reflects my age more than my <laughs> achievements. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to just tell you a, a sequence of ideas, because uh, we don't have a lot of time. And uh, uh, what I would suggest is that you, if you have a question, then you um, kind of accumulate it, and we might just have a few minutes at the end uh, to examine that. Um, I'll, uh, I'll start off, um, well, actually, I'll start off by saying that uh, I belong to the camp which believes that learning cannot happen without teachers. And uh, the only proviso I'll add to that is that the teacher uh, may not be human. <laughs> well, firstly, where are the good teachers? How do you get good teachers? If you look at that graph, um, it's a uh, total uh, uh, scores of English, math, and science at the primary level as you go 250 kilometers away from Delhi into rural India. You see this uh, steady drop in the performance, and that is caused by teacher migration. Teachers who live far away from Delhi want to come to Delhi because of the standard of living. They all try. The good ones succeed leaving the bad ones behind. This is a graph of GCSE results in northeastern England plotted against the density of council housing. There are places where teachers say, we don't feel really very safe. We'd like to move somewhere else. The same problem of remoteness, geographic in India, socioeconomic in that part of this country. Such remoteness exists all over the world. It can be you know, social, it can be economic, it can be um, ethnic, it can be religious. There are places on the planet, and there always will be, where good teachers, for one reason or the other, cannot or do not wish to go. Usually, those are the places which need them the most. So I published this, and I got uh, responses from every, almost every country on the planet saying all kinds of remotenesses and saying, oh, look at those children over there. Look at the aborigine children. Look at the children of New Mexico. They need those teachers, but where are they? About 15 years ago, I found that groups of children can learn to use the internet on their own. And I found that through, uh, as you just heard, an experiment which the press called the hole in the wall, which basically involved putting a computer, somewhat like a do-it-yourself ATM, into a slum wall and leaving it there. In those days, it was very uh, non-intuitive, the result, because uh, you know, computers used to be taught. People used to you know, actually have classes where they said, this is a monitor, this is a mouse, that sort of thing. And um, uh, these children seem to have picked up all that on their own in a language that they don't speak English. So it was very, very puzzling. Here's a quick glimpse at those years. This is the first day at the hole in the wall, 26th of January, 1999. Boy on the right is eight years old, and to his left is a student who is six. And he was teaching her how to browse in English. In the deserts of Rajasthan, <laughs> They found the sound recorder on their own, and uh, uh, this lot of children, it's the first time in their lives that they heard themselves sing, actually. Anyway, so I measured all this. I measured uh, computing literacy improvements within random groups of children in 23 different locations against months, against time. And that's the graph. What it says, basically, is that groups of children left unsupervised with an internet connection anywhere will, in a period of nine months, reach the same level of uh, computing literacy as the average office secretary in the West. Now, that raises a few questions about training. So, but we got it over and over again. These results are uh, pretty firm. 
they've been reproduced all over the world with the, with the same uh, results, roughly. After that, I'm going to cross over a large number of years. I, I came to England in 2006. By that time, I knew that children can teach themselves things using a computer if you just ask them to. You know, just say, you know, can you figure this out? And left them alone. When I came to England, I brought the hole in the wall with me and realized very quickly that you cannot do the hole in the wall experiment in England because you would get frozen children. <laughs> so, I, you know, these were outdoors. So I had to turn them, I had to turn the experiment upside down. I brought the hole in the wall into the English classrooms in northeastern England. How do you do that? You take a classroom, you ask the children to shut down computers, except for one computer for every four of them. That number I got from the hole in the wall. And then you just ask them a question. What kind of question? Well, something that might interest them. Um, you know, what's the easiest way to cut off somebody's head? You know, that sort of thing. Children like that, that kind of question. And uh, you find that they're very good at researching and quickly telling you a whole lot of things about it. Um, we call this a self-organized learning environment or a soul. It's basically chaotic. And the main difficulty I had uh, when I first introduced it was to take the teacher out because she felt that she needed to guide the process. And I realized something about guidance, which I think is very important. When you tell a child, why don't you try putting in the following keywords, you're not necessarily helping him because the unspoken part of what you said is, do not try anything else. Whereas if nobody is around, they try everything. And the results are always surprising. So I did a whole range of uh, experiments. I won't go into the details of it. Everything's published, showed and showed, which showed that children in groups can uh, you know, learn mathematics on their own, change their English pronunciation on their own, culminating in an experiment uh, which was almost a challenge from my fellow faculty members at uh, Newcastle University, which was to say, how far does this go? There has to, it has to have a limit somewhere. So I, uh, uh, I chose a village in southern India and uh, gave them this problem. Uh, they had a hole in the wall computer already there. I asked them to find out uh, the, the biotechnology of how the DNA molecule reproduces. These were 12 year old Tamil speaking children. After three months, they said they'd understood nothing. They tried and they'd understood nothing. I wasn't surprised. So I asked them, uh, how much time did it take before they gave up? And they said, we haven't given up. We look for this information every day. So I said, you don't understand anything. Why do you look at it every day? And a little 12-year-old girl then said, in broken Tamil and English, she said, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> it, it profoundly... Uh, changed my view of learning. Uh, I measured. They'd gone from 0 to 30% in two months on their own under impossible circumstances, a language they didn't know, a subject that's 15 years ahead of their time, uh, on two computers on the street side. How could this be possible? What was happening there? I realized that, uh, th that there's something happening there which I, as a teacher, simply don't know anything about. But 30% Unfortunately, in our Victorian system, is a fail. So how do I get them to pass? I have to get them 20 more marks. Um, I got hold of a local girl, an accountant, who, knows, who knew nothing at all about biology or biotechnology, and I asked them to help the children. She said, how do I do that? I said, well, you just stand behind them and admire them. Every time they do something, they say, wow, how did you do that? What was that page again? Where did you get it from? My God, when I was your age, I was so stupid. Okay, we called it the method of the grandmother. She did it for two months. The results jumped to 50%. Okay. When I looked at that graph, I thought, well, there has to be a mechanism that I don't know anything about. And the first, the biggest question was, how are they reading in English? They're not supposed to. 
I think I have a bit of an answer, and I'm just going to leave it to you as a riddle. If you take four children, and you measure their reading levels, and you find their reading at, let's say, grade four level, when reading together, they will read at grade eight. Try it sometime, and, and, and you'll see how that works. I don't know how exactly it works, because we never measure reading in groups. We measure it individually. Four, five children together seem to amplify intellect, and that is why these incredibly surprising results came out of the hole in the wall. Where do I get grandmothers from? I put out a, a, a request in the Guardian newspaper saying, if you're a British grandmother, if you have broadband and a web camera, would you give me one hour of your time every week for free? In two weeks, I got 200. I know more British grandmothers than anyone in this room. <laughs> so, <laughs> they form what's called the granny cloud. The granny cloud comes over the internet into schools all around the world only to do one thing, to admire children and just tell them how good they are so that they can jump that extra 20%. That's one of the grannies there. Yes. <laughs> So you get the general idea. Um, what do we not know at this stage? Well, I don't know if children can learn to read by themselves. I'm trying an experiment in India right now of whether children can learn to read and understand English by themselves. And I'll show you just a tiny little clip uh, of two uh, little girls trying to figure out the meaning of the word sheep, S-H-E-E-P, -E in Pune, India. As you can see, they achieved their learning objective <laughs> quite quickly. But is that reading? I mean, how far is that going to get them? I don't know yet. I know this, that children in Uruguay who have been exposed to computers for the last, I think, almost 10 years, every child in Uruguay has a computer, read better than children in UK or the US in Spanish, uh, you know, compared to how they read in English over here. Um, does it have anything to do with the computers? I don't know. I have to measure it. We know that children can do all sorts of searching by themselves, but can they search accurately? Can they figure out right from wrong? The children in the Northeast seem to be able to. I have some data, but not enough as of now. We, however, know that children can do wonderful things by themselves. We know that they can do so at earlier and earlier ages. I used to think it starts at six or seven. I've lowered that now to two and a half. Um, mainly because I met a girl uh, who was two and a half years old who, was, uh, who said to me, I've downloaded an app. Uh, she was using her mother's iPad. So, and her mother was not there, of course. So, so I said, you know, you shouldn't do that. It might cost your mother money. And she said, no, it's free. So I said, how do, I said, how do you know it's free? And she, she said, see? And she put up the ad and showed me a little box, the little box that comes on the right-hand side, and says, it can have two kinds of things in it. If it's the squiggly kind of thing, then it costs money. If it's not the squiggly kind, then it's free. <laughs> Is that reading? We have no measure for that kind of reading. Um, we need to revise curriculum all, all around the world to include the internet. I do not understand why mobile phones, tablets, and the internet in general cannot enter the classroom and particularly the examination hall. It might sound terrible, but the thing is, look at the way the earlier age, look at the way how the Victorians handled it. Slide rules, compasses, logarithm tables, everything that they used for solving problems were allowed inside the examination hall because they wanted to see whether you can solve problems in the real world way. Why don't we do that? So as a, as a child in London once put it, they take us into school, take away all our devices, 
and throw us back 200 years, and then we have to wait for four or five hours until they release us again. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's absurd. Um, here's a bit of the British National Curriculum, which says that, basically it says the teacher has to teach that history can be interpreted in different ways. And normally, the proce procedure would be that the teacher would come into class and say, you know, people can write history in different ways and give a long, boring lecture. In my method, what I would do is I would convert it into a question. In a museum in the Indian city of Mathura, there is a statue of the great emperor Kanishka. Who was he and why is his head missing? As we all know, children are interested in missing heads. <laughs> the 15 minutes of searching will tell a group of nine-year-olds in trying to answer that question that history can be interpreted in different ways by different people. We know this generation very well. We see them all over the place and, and we're very critical of them because they are all isolating themselves and they're uh, with their... Um, and and they're, you know, they're always staring at their mobile phones and so on and so forth and wasting time. In a discussion in the Northeast once, I said, how do we know that they're wasting time? And we sort of assumed that they are. Well, what I did was I used a lot of buses in Newcastle and for purely scientific reasons, I would then sit on one of these seats with these little girls and boys in front and peer down at their phones. Okay, research. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I discovered was that they text a lot, they play games sometimes, not as often as you think, and a lot of times they search. They learn continuously from those devices. It's a different form of learning. It's what they want to learn. But then, they are learning. Unlike us, who used to learn only in those few hours in school, and the rest of the time, we were wasting time. Okay, two minutes. Pedagogy needs to include the internet, uh, which it does, you know, but it doesn't mean you show them YouTube videos. As I said, the thing to do is to ask them questions and have them answer it using the internet in the class. This is how we solve problems these days. This is how we solve problems. Doesn't it remind you of the hole in the wall? Uh, <laughs> but that's, the, that's our way. We solve problems in groups. All of these methods are not in school. Here's an example of children researching Cezanne in Killingworth, England. Cezanne was his second name and Paul was his first name. Uh, he was French. I'm going I'm to skip that. But they, they said some lovely stuff about the use of light and shade by, by Cezanne. 15 minutes. This is how we ask children to answer questions. Where did it come from? We need to focus on the internet and collaborative problem solving inside the examination hall. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of examples. And we need to redefine success. We need to look at what doesn't need to be taught. And I know I'm going to get into trouble here. But couldn't handwriting be converted into a hobby like knitting, for example? <laughs> why, why do we need to waste time teaching children to write by hand? We should teach them how to search the web properly. The same for spelling, for grammar, for multiplication tables. These are tools that were invented for a different age, for a different purpose. That time's gone. Why is only 1930s English the right English? You cannot answer an exam uh, uh, using uh, you know, texting language. Who's decided that? Well, this is where it all came from. This is the way administration used to be done. That's the way, OK? Huge human computing systems. The schooling system had to feed that system to produce the clerks who would run the show. This is how we examine today. So if you compare that with the previous picture, you would know who we are still producing those children for, for employers who are dead. So we need to take care of obsolescence. We need to roll curriculum, examination, and pedagogy all into one. And if we can change the assessment system to include the internet, we would drive the change through the schooling system. And we would do so very quickly, very inexpensively. 
It's just one political decision. Thank you very much. Well, that was very exciting, a very exciting start. Um, it's now my great pleasure to uh, introduce our second speaker, film producer Lord Dunn.